Well, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Namaskaram. I'm just happy and honored to be here. Of course, first of all, before I begin, I know a lot of you here are the teachers and professors in the Indian education system. And I'd like to take this opportunity to personally thank you, express my gratitude, and give you my personal salute for what you do, because I am a product of the Indian education system. I got my schooling and college done in a small town in Uttar Pradesh in Hindi medium. But the foundation you gave me is what brought me to, to this point today, so thank you very much. Now I know that you all have had enough dialogue yesterday and this morning about a variety of topics, how to build a world-class institution, the governance, the, the quality, the research collaborations, and all of that. It would be very pretentious on my part to try to add something to that already very rich collection of ideas. Because I know I heard this morning a lot of great ideas are already here. So what I think I could do is something I haven't done before, quite unique, but that's what you do when you are home. And I am home in India. And that is I would basically share the lessons that I have learned in my role with the hope that there might be few things from here that might be of use to you. And I know there are many students in the audience as well, and um, you may not find it relevant today, but you are our future. Tomorrow, you will be the one heading an institution like mine, or the one that you're sitting in here right now, or many other different kinds of organizations. So hopefully, you may find something useful there as well. Now, I have been at the University of Houston for the last five years. And uh, during these five years, the university has gone through transformation in a very important sense. And that is, the university, which was not in the tier one list or the top national list of research universities in the nation, now stands as a tier one institution in America. And I want to share with you exactly what kinds of things I feel from my journey have helped the transformation of that institution. First of all, to tell you, yes, it is 67,000 students at the University of Houston. But interestingly, American University's portfolio is very strange, as I may tell you, because I do have jurisdiction over running a football team and a basketball team and things that can just complicate your life. I mean, this morning before I came here, that's what I was on phone trying to work on athletic realignment. And it's, it really can take a lot of your time. There are, um, the, the university is 85 years old, and there are lots of pockets of excellence. They have been at the university. For instance, there's a number one entrepreneurship program in the nation. There's a number two hospitality management program. There are several programs in chemical engineering, for instance, in social work, in optometry that are ranked absolutely among the very top in the nation. The university is located in Houston, which is the fourth largest city in the United States. It is the energy, oil and gas capital of the world, and it has the largest medical center. There have been, for at least 20 years of effort, in trying to get the University of Houston to be ranked nationally among the top list. When I was hired there five years ago, I brought with me a vision and a blueprint and I told the board in a very secretive interview process, there were 134 candidates. They invited four after a thorough wedding, and those four did the interview. And during my interview, I basically gave them the vision. I told them it is possible for this university to be ranked in the top, and these are the things that need to be done. And they asked me how much time it would take. I told them it would take five to seven years. And I did not know that at that time, but because I was a very strange candidate. If you think about it, in the state of Texas, there had not been a woman chancellor, period. Not just Indian, any woman chancellor. I was the very first one. And Texas is not an ordinary state. I mean, Texas is Texas. It has a very interesting politics and an interesting attitude, very independent. So, 
In some ways, you know, people call it a very male-dominated state. Now, at, I was hired for that job within two hours after the interview, even though I was not the, the, the prime candidate for them. And I think the reason they hired took a gamble on me, a very different person, because so far, until that time, there had not been an Indian born uh, presiding any research university in the nation. So I was the first one in that sense as well. And yet, they gave me a chance. Today, after five years later, the university ranks in the top research universities, but there are many other benchmarks also that have changed. The student enrollment has gone up from 58,000 to 67,000. Our private donations to the university, they used to be about 37, 38 million a year, are now 100 million and over 100 million a year. Our research has gone twice as much. We started a research park where we are not just incubating the, universe, the, the, the ideas, but where we have started to manufacture now based on the technology of our own faculty. And in terms of the revenue from those technologies, I mean, we are not just having the technology, we are taking it to the marketplace, investing it, and selling that, that technology or putting that technology in the use of the society. And the revenue that we get from IP has now gone from $600,000 a year to $17 million a year. So this is what I call a transformation of a university. So let me tell you some of these things. How is it that these things got accomplished? And before I begin, I want you to know one other thing. Even though I had said it would take five to seven years, the University of Houston became a tier one institution in three years. And they ran a big, my faculty and staff ran a big advertisement in the local newspaper, which is, of course, Houston, you know, which is a large city, it's a big newspaper, which said in a big, bold letters, our president was wrong. And you had to read the whole thing to understand why they put there, because I had said it would take five to seven years. And it is because the faculty and his staff and the administration, they did it. But there were several key factors that I feel were important. So lesson number one that I learned that I can share with you is you must have the courage to have a bold dream, a dream that is bold. I was given lessons during my workshops that prepare people for presidency, where I do the training now in America. When I went to that workshop before becoming president, they told me one thing is you should promise less and perform more. What do I do the minute I take the job? I promise more. I made myself vulnerable, and I was advised by many people, including the commissioner of higher education in the state of Texas, is Renu, I like you, why are you doing this? Because you know you can't get this thing done in five to seven years, and then your board will fire you. I say, I can tell you if I don't do that, if I don't make myself vulnerable, if I don't have a goal that is inspiring, if I don't talk about it, I can tell you right now that the board will definitely fire me because we'll never get there. So you have to choose what is it that an institution needs. Because eventually, if you think about it, a leadership is not about what a leader does. A leadership is about what a leader can inspire an organization to do. And if an organization can do something with the leader that they can't do without the leader, then that's where the value addedness of a leader is. So the only, only a skill set that I have is to inspire my organization to give tools and hopes and dreams and encouragement to my faculty and his staff because I know they truly are capable of doing big things. And that was the, my gamble. Lesson number two, you have to create an expectation of excellence because if once you settle with mediocrity, it is so hard to get out of that mentality. When I joined the University of Houston, I went, my first one week was, I went to visit every single college within the university. And every single college as I went there, they said, we are number one. I said, really? Says who? Well, we are just number one because we think we are number one. Well, I don't buy that kind of thing. So then I decided I would go and spend an hour and a half without anybody with me, no entourage, no escort, no provost, no dean, nobody. Me, just me, I went there, sat down with every single department faculty. For an hour and a half, I said, tell me more about what you do. 
and they'll tell me, and I ask them, where did you get your PhD? And they'll all tell me where they got their PhD from all tier one institutions, how great they are. At the end of the session, I'll tell them, I say, help me understand one thing. How is it possible for you individually, for every single one of you to be excellent, but collectively for us to be mediocre? And that thing started people thinking about it. I am, was not afraid, and I'm not afraid to challenge, to say, when something is mediocre, it is mediocre. When something is excellent, it is excellent. And I think that expectation becomes really very, very, very important. I also, of course, had to change the administration. There were many people who were there for 25 years and 28 years. They were settled in mediocrity. They were comfortable in mediocrity. I gave every single person an opportunity to join the wagon, come on, and try to let's change this, transform the institution, do something different. Let's stand by students. Let's not just admit students. Let's pay attention to what are we doing with them. Are we giving them the globally competitive skill set that will make them leaders? Are we making, helping them graduate? Are, or are we just simply using excuses, saying we've done everything possible? Are we competing with the best in the most difficult circumstances, or are we simply sitting back and saying, well, we've never really competed in that competition before? And when I didn't feel that they had the courage or they had the orientation and aptitude to really change, very ruthlessly, I actually changed the entire administration. So in about four years, not a single vice president was the same who was there before. Eight of the 12 deans were different. I did not change the institution. They changed. The people who came there with the philosophy and, and the attitude that we have to take risk, that we have to call excellence, excellence. Lesson number three, I know that if you benchmark something, you will improve. If you don't benchmark, if you don't measure something, chances are you will live in that whole atmosphere of delusion that you are actually good, while you may not be good. So when I came to the University of Houston, I came from an institution in Florida, where as a provost, again, we went through the similar journey, moved that university from tier two to tier one. I brought with me my data person because I say I cannot trust anybody at that new institution. I don't know if the data is right, what they're doing, I don't know, simply. So I wanted to bring somebody with me, and that person came there very ruthlessly, made sure that the database was right, was correct, the measurements were good, so that I knew where the pockets of excellence were and where the pockets of excellence were really not there. We said we'll use international and national benchmarks. And if people said we are number one, where, where, which database? And if you don't have the database to show, fine, then you know, tell me how in your own discipline people think that you are number one or whoever is number one. What would it take us to get to the next level? And I can tell you that did become very important. And then came the budget cuts because you all know the United States of America's economy has been bad. We were lucky in Texas and in Houston with oil and gas, we did not have that kind of budget problems, but nonetheless, we did have budget cuts. When the budget cuts came, the first issue came from the faculty and from the staff and particularly administration as well what about our goal of being tier one now? Because we have complete benchmarks, the whole blueprint, exactly how we are going to get there. Where we are, where we need to go, what's the fuel, and how we will achieve and be there. They said, maybe we should think about our goal. I said, excuse me, once we collectively set the goals, we do not negotiate on goals. Goals are what they are, they will remain what they are. Let's sit down, brainstorm on how we will get there. If the state will not give us money, there may be other ways for us to raise money, to grow money, to develop money, to find funds so that we can invest. And I, people know me there that I do not negotiate on goals. One of the things when I came, I said we need to have for being a world-class institution, being nationally ranked, I mean, we knew exactly where we wanted to be ranked. In order to be nationally ranked, we need to have more members of the National Academy who are very few, and very prized. I said, we need to recruit members of the National Academy. I was told by my, all my top faculty, they said it is not possible because University of Houston has not recruited one since 1984. 
I said, well, that's okay, because University of Houston was recruiting for the University of Houston. We are going to recruit now for Houston, not for the University of Houston, because we have many institutions in Houston. Researchers simply want to be able to do research. They don't care the setting that you are in. You have, we have to develop partnerships. We have to build alliance with other institutions. But if we recruit it to give them an opportunity, a platform in Houston to do their research, I know we can compete against the best and we can recruit people here. It took us seven months, but we got our first member of National, National Academy recruited. All of a sudden, the faculties, you know, eyes changed. They said, oh, it is possible. You have to find a way to give confidence to the institution that things are possible. Okay, the one other thing that became important for us in terms of measures and benchmarks is because at the end of the day, a university is a university because of the students. You, students, whoever you are here, I know, you are the heart and soul of an institution if because if the students were not at a university, we would be an institute, a center, we would not be a university. So our first and foremost attention has to be students. Are we just admitting? What are we doing with them? We completely changed the portfolio of the University of Houston. We built so many residence halls. We built the dining facilities that I can guarantee you today that if you do come, you'll find that there are not that many kinds of dining facilities anywhere in the world. We did not want to build things that were just okay because I want my students to come to the university regardless of what backgrounds they come, and I know we serve many students from very underprivileged backgrounds. I want them to come, feel special, know that we treat them like they're the best in the world, and that because once they graduate, they will go and do things that are best in the world. So, now, lesson number four that we, I have learned, and that is a university can only be successful if a community wants that university to be successful. That means university has to be relevant to the community. In order for us to be relevant to the community, we had to see what is it, what's the industrial base of our city, energy industry. You have oil and gas, every single major oil and gas company has a headquarter there in Houston. Well, the University of Houston didn't even have a petroleum engineering program. If you don't care for the industry, the workforce, the talent they need, why should the industry care and come to you and help you when you need help and help you build? And it's, so we made it sure that our university will become relevant to the community. We have the largest medical center. We were not even member of the Texas Medical Center. They invited me one day, one time for lunch meeting with the CEOs of Texas Medical Center I went there after that, they invited me as a courtesy because I don't have a medical school, and that's it. All I need is foot in the door, and after that, we'll take care of it. And then we became very quickly a member of the Texas Medical Center, and now we have programs with three medical schools, all three of them in Houston, so that we can take students directly into our university and transfer them directly uh, into one of the three medical schools. Those kinds of partnerships became important. With the energy industry, we created a partnership with them. So right now, today, every CEO of every major oil and gas company serves on my energy advisory board. They help us. They are the ones who sent their people from industry to sit down with our faculty, design a curriculum that was relevant to students, not just today, but when they'll graduate four years down the road. And guess what? Something is very new happening in the energy industry. It's not the old ways, it's the new ways, and that is fracking. In case you haven't heard, this is hydro hydraulic fracking or fracturing, which mixes chemical sand and high pressure water to extract oil and gas from the rocks where it was not possible to do so before. Because of that technology, the United States all of a sudden has a huge reservoir now of gas and oil, and it can be self-sufficient in many ways. It will change global politics. We started the program first in the country because if you are sitting right there with the industry, you have to work with the industry to try to see what are their needs, what will they need. And I think that's what is giving us our push. And that industry is coming there, investing millions of dollars in the university in all kinds of different programs, from petroleum engineering to energy management 
to global energy institutes, to energy policy, to energy law. I mean, we really are benefited from that. I can tell you also that engaging with the community has a second component, and that is we have to tell our story to the industry as well and to the community. Because if you keep doing good things and people don't know about it, it doesn't really build the momentum. It doesn't build that snowballing of effect. So we created a speaker's bureau. There is not a single Rotary Club or Lions Club or Petroleum Club or any kind of organization in Houston where somebody from the university has not gone and has spoken about the University of Houston. And we do so every year. We've created a whole bureau of a speaker's bureau. And I am out there practically every day almost. My university color is red. I'm not wearing red today. But my university color is red. I wear red. I'm out there telling them how important the university is for you. I sat down with the 50 movers and shakers one by one in, in their offices and talked to them and told them that why is it the University of Houston is a tier two university and not a tier one? In your city, where your business is doing so good, how come you have not taken care of the university? And, I, and they truly admitted that it is true that they have really not taken care of the university. Well, that is the reason why we are today from 38 million to 112 million last year we raised for the university for academic programs. And we are just about ready to launch a $1 billion campaign to get the $1 billion into the university in order to support the academic dreams that we have. Lesson number five, and that's my last lesson. You have to put yourself through an ultimate test. Are you getting better? And how do you know? Everybody may have their own way of testing. Are we getting better? Because the road to success is always under construction. You can never sit back and think, I'm done. You constantly have to keep on looking at things. We're just doing our new strategic plan. I have a very simple test. You may or may not find it right, but I have, that's the test I use. My theory is that every organization was academic, particularly is academic, but even other organizations, always have 10% of the people in that organization who are absolutely comfortable. They don't want things changed because they know that their power will shift if things changed. But every single organization that has 10% of those people also has 10% of people who are ready to change. They, all they want is a leader who will empower them to change. They are there. And the 80% of the people will move and shift wherever the direction is, wherever the tide is. And an institution gets grappled in mediocrity when it's the bottom 10% in terms of productivity and their dreams and desires have the empowerment. And many a times academic institutions do get somehow complacent and get controlled, get sort of overwhelmed by those faculty. However, my test then is somebody is going to be unhappy in my institution. Which 10% are happy and which 10% are unhappy? That's my test. If I'm getting complaint from those people who really don't care to change, I think my deans are doing a good job. I just want to move the shift here, power. And every organization needs that kind of a power shift. And the, the minute you keep make that power shift you are able to do, the institution will change. I know Gujarat has really expanded its educational portfolio. I know there are many, many new institutions in India. I know there are new institutions here. And I know now the desire is the next step. And that was the session, next move forward. And the desire, once you are here, you are established, you say, OK, how do I get excellent? How do I get to be nationally and globally competitive? There may be different ways of getting it there, but I can tell you one thing. The road is not easy. The road is not without controversy. The road is not without fearless people. The no road is not without, without sacrifices. All of that has to happen. The good thing is, I think I feel, being here in Gujarat, and even I keep listening all the time, keep hearing all the time, many, many, many Gujarati friends I have there too, who are constantly coming. I'm in India twice a year for Prime Minister's Global Advisory Council. So I do visit, and I know the Gujarat's uh, success story. What a remarkable, marvelous success story you have. 
you have already taken first step. You have already set the dream. Remember I said you've got to have bold dream. You have already set the bold dream. Your chief minister already set the bold dream. It's really very refreshing to see that kind of boldness. And now I think it is up to every single one of us, from students, the faculty, to staff, to administration, to the government, to society, to industry, to really pull together and say we are not going to tolerate mediocrity. And I can tell you at my institution, I do my level best to empower the students because I know their future is at stake whatever we are doing today. When we start freshman class, I visit every single student because I target freshman classes and I personally go visit them and I tell them, thank you for coming to the university. I'm so happy you are here. And now I'm committed to you. And I give them my personal email. I said, I'm watching for you. If you cannot resolve your issue, you send me an email. And they do. And this way I also know what kinds of issues are being taken care of. I am with them watching football game. I'm with them taking lunch because I know they will tell me if things are not right. And then, I always use social media as well. I mean, I'm constantly on Twitter, so I know if there are problems because people will tweet and tell me the things are wrong, the Wi-Fi is not working, or the parking is not available. Try to help. But if the leadership is engaged, is passionate, is committed, I think things will happen. And I see you already have those ingredients here. So I only say, Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for giving me some of your vibrancy that I can take with me and be inspired. And I wish you all the best. Good luck.